think it still lives in William Sheely. It does. Uh, I've, I've, I've run my life in a much different way than I'm sure most people do. I stopped working for other people in real jobs, so to speak, 26 years ago. So I've pretty much invented my life. In 1984, I started the Cleveland Artists Foundation as a nonprofit to honor local artists who have evolved in this region. First, it was pretty much a, a historic artist focus. Now it includes contemporary people as well. I've had a number of different art galleries. Uh, I started a little nonprofit organization uh, in, back in 2002 called New Cat, which focused more on electronic arts, and we did that in different ways for several years. But this iteration now with Cocoon Arts Club, kind of, it's based on the old Cocoon Arts Club idea that was born in 1911, of again keeping that artistic creative spirit always moving forward in some way, not getting stuck in just traditional types of ways of creating art, but always looking at new things. Uh, the computer graphics world and electronic arts get the same type of knock in a way that photography did when it first attempted to be recognized as a fine art. There, there was always this unfortunate reaction that, oh, well, this is made with a machine, it's not really art. Well, the machines are just tools. Brushes and, and other things are tools, too. And you actually really do have to have an interest in learning what a machine can do and how you can manipulate it to become a more creative instrument. And that's the creative element. Uh, machines don't create their own art. It takes human interaction. So I, I just think that human creativity in the arts are, are one of the best things that humans have to offer. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing to be involved with, and I intend to do it until I drop. Cool. Are we doing stereo, stereo optics here, or am I going to be in 3D? <laughs> uh, we'll see. There's always safety and backup. Oh, you know? okay. All right. And, and right. I See Music is here visiting the Lookout Cleveland exhibit of William Sheely. Mr. Sheely was the road manager and uh, worked with the band for, and Bob Dylan for many years, and probably best to let him tell his story. Okay, thank you. Uh, this exhibition was put on primarily because when we opened it on April 17th, it marked exactly 40 years from the date that the band played their first concerts as the band in San Francisco. And so that was a rather important date to meet. And what I'm showing here are some prints and memorabilia and photographs uh, of mine from the time period of 1969 through 1976. Uh, my brother John also took a lot more photographs, but we didn't have the opportunity to uh, meld those with this group right now, but that's a future project. So here we have a, a replica of the very first poster that was used in San Francisco for those first shows. And this was obviously a Bill Graham production out at Winterland in San Francisco. And on the other side, we've got some screen prints that I did from photographs that my brother John took at the 1971 Bangladesh concert. So we've got a, a rather iconic shot of Bob Dylan, and then the other one is, is George Harrison, Dylan, and Leon Russell. So these were things, there were times during my tenure with the band that I took off little periods and came back to Ohio and went to art school uh, at the Cleveland Institute of Art and Ohio University. So these were actually done at Ohio U in the print department down there. Are, are these wood prints or? No, these are screen prints. Screen prints? Yeah, so they're, they're from photographic images that are actually codolith, which means high contrast black and white. And so they're a little bit more dramatic in some ways. There, there's no tonal change in terms of blacks and grays. So they were done more as a, a poster type of effect print. Much like the Jap one that's in there. Yeah, yeah, you want to move in there? Cool. Is that decent enough? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Let's grab that other camera too. So maybe we can just kind of, do you want to set here and we can then kind of pan around. Pan around, yeah, let me uh, make sure where we are. 
level wise, that's not that too bad actually. Except the artist is tall. <laughs> the artist is tall. Yeah, right. Yeah, maybe I should no, stand no, no, in a no, hole. No. <laughs> I always have to watch that when hanging things, you know, if I hang, I've learned that if I hang at a level that I'm comfortable with, it's too high for, right, for everyone else. Yeah. So tell me about the Joplin picture. It's okay, the Joplin classic. was, yeah, it was another uh, image that my brother John took. This is actually from the 1970 Canadian train tour called the Festival Express. So it's it's more of a close-up. He's got more of them where she's singing with Rick Danko and other people on the train. But it was just a good expression, and we thought we'd make something different out of it. And then these two are, again, a little bit different prints. This is a screen print, again, originally derived from that photo of Bob, but then playing around with Mari patterns for a different type of look. And the one at the bottom here is actually an etching that is a whole different printing process using metal plates and etching into it. Then we get into the beginning of my photography, which began if, in 1973. If we can add that Festival uh, Express tour or so, uh Mythical. I, I was wondering if I uh, did you you actually rode on that train and no, actually I let my brother take over at that oh, time. Okay. I was fried and he took over for that little blip. Oh, yeah. So we'd have to get the tales from him. Yeah, yeah. Sound. Yeah. It, it was then. It was at your brother's quote then saying that Garcia and Chaplin were on a uh, uh, acid and southern comfort. Uh, Every, everybody pretty was wise. pretty much, the whole train, I mean, that when they actually bought out one town's liquor supply at one point when they stopped. Mm -hmm. So it was a little crazy. And, and that was what, the Molson Air Kids or, or some, some something like that. store or something? And it was a funny time. I mean, the summer of 1970, there was a lot of reaction going on. That I mean, one of the things was, for some reason, everybody thought these concerts should be free. You know, it was that kind of attitude and uh, kind of a funny concept. I mean, yes, there have been free concerts, but why does everything have to be free? I mean, it is a business, right, and right. Uh, it, it's it's kind of goofy in my mind. I don't know. And it wasn't that that the 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 whole tour that airs attempt to try to spread hippie culture across Canada. It, it seemed lag. that that was part of a thing, and I, I believe they even cut the, the tour short because of all the problems that occurred at each place, okay. and it just wasn't a comfortable situation. Yeah, so yeah. everybody kind of pulled back from it and said, okay, we've done this much, we're not doing anymore. How, how, how intermeshed were the band and the dead on a you know, social basis. Was there much interaction? Or? Over time we played a lot with, well, we played with the dead. I mean, the, the whole Watkins Glen and the following Roosevelt Stadium concerts were with the Grateful Dead. Uh, Watkins Glen also included the Allman Brothers, but that was a, an interesting approach too because Watkins Glen was conceived of in the summer of 1973 of possibly drawing 100,000 people with three major bands of the time and it wound up drawing 650,000 people and being bigger than Woodstock right. and so that was a very odd effect to everybody. The crowd kind of came in over a long period of time. There weren't the problems I don't believe that the Woodstock Festival had because it was a little bit more open territory, it wasn't on the New York Thruway, and I don't remember there being huge traffic problems. There was a, a more open spread where people could pull out into the landscape and, and just park, and so it was a little freer in that regard. But it, it, but it had lost the ethic of having to be free music, free festival. Oh yeah, that, that, that one. Although I'm not sure if they were able to collect money from everybody that came, you know. Right. That might have been something that 
sort of happened at Woodstock Festival, but I don't remember exactly, because I don't remember hearing a lot of news about that aspect of it, about any promoters being ticked off because people were getting in for free. Uh, so I'm not sure of the, the absolute specifics on that one. Thank you for digressing off of <laughs> But uh, all right, tell me about when you you know your era here as as photographer and what 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 made you decide it was time to stop working and be a photographer more of a a casual or, or what how'd your role what was your role and, and how okay, did it evolve? Okay, all right, I was hired um, by my friend John Taplin. John Taplin was more of the business and road manager, if you want to put a title to it and I was more the equipment and stage manager. It was my job to literally handle all of the equipment. I did the setup, I drove the truck, we did teardown. During the concert, I was always on stage right there with the band, mm -hmm. and I would hide as much as I could behind amplifiers and, and other things. But basically, my responsibility during a concert was to watch everybody to see if problems arose. Sometimes there were changes of instruments that had to be done. And it was an interesting progression over time of being able to really become familiar with them and their songs and what they wanted to do. They were, they were a really a landmark group in, in just the way they set up the stage. Gar's organ was in the center stage towards the rear. Uh, Richard's piano was on stage right, and Le uh, Levon's drum kit was on the other side. And then Robbie and Rick were in between. And this was done to enable the three main singers, Richard and Rick and Levon, to all see themselves easier because they sang very tight harmonies and they really wanted that visual ability instead of, you know, some bands sort of set up in a straight line and that's just not conducive to cons. It's like sitting at a bar and constantly looking over and trying to talk to somebody. It's just uh, not good. So in that, uh, there was a lot of progression too in terms of the equipment. The band was very particular in the way they sounded. So at the kinds of concerts in the beginnings in 1969, 70, and 71, for instance, we largely played small theaters. And that was a lot of fun because we could go in midday, we could set up the equipment and do a sound check and literally tune the hall. As things became bigger, as we played more coliseums and all of that, it became tougher to do that and it just became a different era. And then the outdoor gigs were just insane because you can't really do a whole lot of anything because you're playing to the infinite space of the world we live in. Now one thing that did happen here, um, this was the Grateful Dead sound system. So you see on, on each side of the stage they just had numerous stacks of, of speaker cabinets of all kinds and they actually had a guy along with them who continued to build more and more speaker cabinets for them. Was that Owsley or...? No, that was not Owsley. Owsley was sort gone. of in charge of... He was in charge of the sound system, but he was more into the mixing and the balancing of the sound. I thought he was like so... Uh, pat he held patents and electrical patents and all kinds of stuff like this. I mean, wasn't he... he yeah, he was a tinkerer and yeah. he, he, he dealt with the chemistry of things as well, too. <laughs> Off the track, have you heard any of like the? He just released a Flying Burrito Brothers CD last year from his live archives and oh, yeah, some Quicksilver yeah, stuff. Yeah. So he's finally realizing all that junk he did was worth some money in his sure. old age. Yeah. <laughs> well, and there's that whole Wolfgang's Vault uh, group too, yeah, which yeah. is actually Bill Graham's archives. Right, right. And it's interesting stuff that actually a lot of things exist. I mean, the archives that I have, the memorabilia. I'm kind of amazed that I still have. I mean, I've got song set lists and stage set up diagrams and things of that nature, but it was just happenstance that I kept them and, and they exist now. Uh, I've, I've asked other people um, if they have anything and not a lot of people do. <laughs> so it's, it's a curious thing. I mean, it wasn't really about that. Nobody, I didn't consciously think, oh, I'm going to keep this for posterity. It's just what I do. I mean, I sort of collect things anyway. So. That's what happens. But um, 
The Watkins Glen concert was, was an interesting thing because as with all outdoor concerts, you have the weather effects. And that's always a pain when you've got electricity because somebody's always uh, in trouble of being electrocuted, especially with lots of power on stage. So that has happened in the past, but Watkins Glen was just one of those watershed moments again, too. I think because of the fact that it was the Allman Brothers and the Grateful Dead and the band, and there was a little jamming at times, too, because we got there early and, and everybody set up, and, and so there was opportunity. I mean, the band were never known as a jam band. I mean, I think Allman Brothers and certainly Grateful Dead mm -hmm. had a little bit more of that in them, but the band got into the, the mode. And well, the, the, the two prior days soundcheck jam tapes have circulated for many years in the, in the yeah. dead trading circles and uh, I, I, there might have been minimal band guys coming and playing there was uh, almonds and dead yeah. playing together but yeah. Uh, yeah. you know but uh, the glory the glory Americana jam I don't think really happened yeah no I, I think Garth participated I think Richard went up a few times and, okay. and maybe Ricky uh, but yeah it, it was selective depending on what you wanted to do. What, uh, you know, one of the slams against the dead's always been sloppy. Your musicianship that wasn't quite there, whereas Robbie, you know, mathematical, mm -hmm. guitar and all that. I mean, any recollection of his opinion of Garcia as a guitarist or? As no, a I mean, I think everybody respected everyone else for the space that they created as musicians. I think the dead were born of a whole different environment than the band was. Mm -hmm. And the band was really more honed by Ronnie Hawkins, who was into more of the R&B stuff from the 50s and a lot of classical rock and roll that required a tightness in the way the group played. Uh, the band was always different from others too, much of the time, because they had two keyboard players. Uh, going with, with Garth on organ and Richard on piano, and they only had one guitarist who handled both lead and rhythm work, and then Ricky played bass, and uh, Levon, of course, was an extraordinary drummer who also had an extraordinary voice, and in, in some ways, Levon was sort of the original member of the band because he was the first to join Hawkins and everybody else joined over time. And didn't they even put out singles as Levon and the Hawks? Yes they did, yeah, yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact there's a lot of material with Levon and the Hawks. And I think I remember Ralph Gleason writing after the first concerts in San Francisco, wow I realize now this is Levon's band. And so there was always that, but actually the guys in the band always thought of themselves as equals, that there was no real leader. I mean, over time, Robbie wound up writing more songs than anybody else, but that was just his position. Garth also was the musical genius, and he was actually brought in by Hawkins to teach the rest of the guys more about real music and how it's structured and wrote it down for them and all. But one of the things I, I witnessed too very closely was that these people, had, they had already been together for a good 10 years before I joined them in 1969. So they were a well-oiled group. I mean, they were just as tight as a drum or as loose as a goose. And, and they were just spectacular musicians. I remember a lot of times too, when we would set up in a place and do sound checks, that they would do a lot of very funky R&B stuff to, to set the system. And they were always a very bottom-oriented band, too. A lot of bass, mm -hmm. a lot of growling going on. And I always used to think that that was wonderful stuff, and they rarely played that during concerts. During a concert, they had a very specific set that was based initially on music from Big Pink and then songs from the Brown album that was the second one. And so it always grew, but it was pretty much structured. You know, I think again, going back to The Grateful Dead, they had a lot of opportunity where they were just set up to do a lot of jams, is that they would play songs that just lent themselves to more freeform uh, takeoffs on, on the original. So, I mean, 
about Baby Don't You Do It would be about the jammiest I could think of the band getting in and, and, yeah. and, and letting loose with something that lyrically didn't matter as much as, you yeah. know, or was that kind of song. And I, I think, of course, the one song that really enabled free form improvisation was Chess Fever, and, mm -hmm. and that was always Gar's highlight of, of every set and the way things developed in their concerts because Garth took it from being just a few seconds of an introduction into being, what, 10, 15 minutes perhaps at a time mm -hmm. in its longest and, and the band, the rest of the guys just kind of faded off stage and let it be the break for them and then they would leave it up to Garth to improvise all over the place. Well, it lets me uh it makes me think, well, what were you guys doing recording-wise, or did you tape every show, and, and what was happening with regard to documenting the... Not all the time. A, a lot of times we would record off of the mixing board on stage, just for referencing. Right. Uh, it wasn't really, I don't think, until Tour 74 when every show was recorded uh, live, and, you know, Sporadically things were done. Back in 71, 72 when we played several nights at the Academy of Music, that was done very specifically for the double live album that became Rock of Ages. Um, but no, like I said, a lot of things were done. For instance, we had a lot of trouble finding the right kind of balances of what mics to use for the vocals and then also what speaker systems we could use for stage monitors. That was always the hardest thing to do. In their desire for perfection on stage, there was a lot of experimentation with those different elements to find the right way that they could finally hear themselves well. And this is, of course, long before the era of now that they put an ear plug in and, and that's your monitoring system. This was long before that. The other element uh, in terms of equipment that was a, a difficult one that took a while to figure out was the piano, the uh, acoustic piano. Miking it. And yeah, we, we, we used help and still pickups and other brands of pickups and different miking systems. But actually that was always a lot of fun too, to try to see what did work best and constant experimentation. And that also then flowed over to their recording techniques uh, because they never really liked classic re recording studios. Uh, once again, they didn't like being boxed in and not being able to see each other. So way back when I first met them, they were still in Sammy Davis's uh, pool house uh, in Los Angeles that they had set up to begin recording the, uh, the first half of the second album. And again, it was just a very casual sort of circular setup so once again everybody could see and there would be baffles around some of the amps so there wasn't too much sound leakage out of the amplifiers but it was it was a very relaxed feeling and there was a lot of ability to play with the actual sound of everything Levon for instance with his drum set talking about sort of a bottom end approach his drums were never tightly tuned so they had a more of the snap and crackle, they were always more of the thumping sound. And it's a pretty spectacular thing. And then we would use different materials to actually put in some of the drums to deaden the sound a little bit. So there was always playing around with everybody's equipment to create a sound that wasn't typical. You know, it wasn't right out of the box or something. Uh, in the very early days, I think a lot of people were very confused with Robbie's guitar parts on. Uh, music from Big Pink, uh, right off the first song, Tears of Rage. And that was his guitar being played essentially through a miniature Leslie speaker that Garth had built for him. And a Leslie speaker for the organs have actually revolving uh, speakers, so it gives that eerie sound of actually rotating and a very physical quality to it. So it's it's very cool thing. and. We actually carried the black box Leslie with us for most of the first year and a half or so and then it was just eventually discarded as other types of electronic uh, equipment were developed to do different things. I'm looking for his Leslie inflicted scar. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
but where do we go from here? Um, yeah, that led me into thinking about uh, it must have been neat then to have a studio with engineering the next studio product, project, stage yeah. path, or stage fright, you know? Yeah. Now, was, was he, uh, was Todd Rundgren a uh, compliant contributor? Because I, any other production story where he wasn't producer, but yeah. I read that, you know, you always read he's a studio tyrant and people yeah. either adore him or can't deal with him. Yeah. Uh, what was... Actually, Stage Fright was a, a funny one, you know, that that was actually conceived of to be a recording that would blend right into a live concert for an audience in Woodstock. Uh, that never happened, but we did set up on the Playhouse stage. And go, 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 go back and explain, like Townsend was doing something similar with Lifehouse, which the abortion is who's next, where he tried to join together with the audience and the band to bring everyone together and unite the audience and the band. Is this sort of what, was there a band version of this? Or? Well, I, I, I think it was and, uh, because the Woodstock Festival had already happened and caused a lot of fear in the Woodstock community. Um, that was one of the reasons it never happened. People were fearing that if the band goes live at the Woodstock Playhouse, this might bring too big a crowd to a very small community and overwhelm it. I mean, the, the Woodstock Playhouse was right as Route 212 came into the center of town, just barely off center. And so the, the physical nature of that wasn't going to allow it, and that was recognized pretty quickly. Uh, but it was interesting. Todd was brought in to help engineer that album. The band was always looking for different approaches. So I think Albert Grossman actually wanted to see what would happen if he brought in a younger element like Todd to work with these uh, fellows who had been around for a few years. And actually that album was then spun off too and some of it was sent over to London to Glyn Johns mm. who also put his mix in on some of the songs as well too. So it was a very strange album and uh, I think at one point when there were some releases and, and I listened to it, it sounded flat. And I think since the subsequent remixings, it has a much fuller sound now because there's, there's some beautiful work that was done there, but I'm not sure if it was originally recognized with the first release of the album. Um, so, and, and, and it just was a time where the band was actually after the whole, after Stage Fright, ha the uh, festival tour did happen in, in Canada. And then I, I came back to Ohio for a while and the band did, I believe, a little bit of a southern tour and a bit of a European tour after that. And then they kind of went into seclusion back in Woodstock the Bearsville studios were built. Now Bearsville is not that much different than Woodstock. It's a mile west. Uh, but that's where Albert Grossman lived and that's where his focus was in developing the Bear restaurant and some other things here. So once again the band helped Albert develop Bearsville studios up in the hills near his house. And that's where they worked on Cahoots and Moondog Matinee. So those years of, of later 71 and 72 and maybe early 73 were mostly devoted to just hanging around Woodstock and recording at their own pace. Uh, so it wasn't a big touring time and during that period of time was when I came back to Ohio and went to art school for a while. Then as 73 continued to move on, I came back to help do uh, this summer uh, concert in, in Watkins Glen and then immediately after that Roosevelt Stadium down in New Jersey where these few shots were taken. And then at that time too we moved out to Southern California in, in the early fall of 1973. So again that was part of my job to help physically move people from Woodstock finally out to Southern California and the decision had been made to leave Albert Grossman's management umbrella and more or less go on on their own again. Bob had moved out a year before, 
We all moved out in the fall of 73. We recorded Planet Waves with him and then began a series of several uh, um, rehearsals up in the mountains at a, at a, a camp to rehearse for Tour 74. And if, if you'll remember now, Bob had not really been on the road since 1966 at this point. So this was a, a gap of eight years that he really hadn't toured. So that was part of the point, is just to begin working. And he had such familiarity with the band that it was a lot of fun being around at that time because every day around noonish everybody would gather and just sit down and start playing songs and try to figure out okay what are we going to do and, and where are we going to put this song and, and what are we going to do here and, and it was just great fun and uh, and everybody just basically geared up and, and got ready and in early January of 1974 we began the tour in, in Chicago for a couple of dates. You know, that brings up to my mind you know, all the backing bands that Dylan's had lately. Most of them talk about his pleasure of on stage games of what am I playing, what do I want to yeah. play, S having him start a song and singing different, a different song over that arrangement, um, knowing the 74 set lists and I don't know, 70% of it was the same show, but there were certainly slots and, and, and dr dramatic change, like Hattiesburg, Mississippi comes to mind of having a lot of the protest, civil rights protest songs being played sure. in reverence to where are we. Yeah. Um, so was there less of, was there more of a let's do this right and do this the best we can than do I get perverse pleasure from screwing up my backup band or? No, he really, he really didn't play around too much. I mean, there, there was always the chance that he might want to change tempo or sometimes key or, yes, maybe even a different song, but the set list changed a little bit in the first two concerts and I believe that was just really getting to feel, does this feel right? Are we doing it right? Are we, because it started off with Bob and the band and, and then Bob also wanted to allow the band to do some of their songs. He also wanted to do some of his own songs acoustically by himself and then bring everybody back together. Interestingly enough, at some point, maybe about a third of the way into the tour, this was a six-week tour and almost every day there was a concert. There were very few days where there weren't. But the decision was made to play Most Likely You Go Your Way and I'll Go Mine as the very opening song. It also became the end song to the concert. So that was an interesting little flip around and the other thing that they commented on quite frequently especially in the beginning was the experience of playing 1965-66 a lot of similar things that they were playing here in 74 there were a lot of boos. there was a lot of negativity from the audiences to the fact that Bob wanted to play with this electric band they, there were too many purists in the folk movement, I think, who really just wanted to hear him play his acoustic guitar and his folk songs. But that's not the evolution of Bob Dylan. And what they were amazed with, of course, was this overwhelming acceptance and huge applause from these giant crowds of what they were doing. Right. And all of a sudden, everything got very energized. And, and this tour almost became a race. It was like a lot of the tempos of the songs became faster. It was almost as if Bob and the guys were screaming rather than singing. It was a very funny occurrence, but it was loud, you know. I mean, we were playing these halls that were mostly coliseums, so I think, you know, the attendances were probably maybe 20, maybe 30,000. I don't know what the actual capacities of every place was, but it was more in that basketball coliseum realm. And so there were a lot of people there, and, and there was a lot of noise to put out, and it just was very exciting. And then the one shot that I have of the, uh, the lighters being lit at the end of the concert, was that was the first time that that had ever happened. So that was a, a unique situation in the concert world at that time, which has now morphed into people holding up their cell phones with their lighted... Uh, displays.
Or, or on the iPhones, they now have a, or a, 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 a lighter that shows up that lights. So. Okay, well, yeah. It's all adaptation of technology. Mm -hmm. But what else can we talk about here? For uh, you? When you were talking about there was a show every night or every day, uh, was this the beginning of the two two setup system, or did you no. really have to tear down and set up and a day. Tear down and set up. And get there. Yeah. And, and this was, you know, in, in the past when, when we traveled with the band, we always had our own truck. It wasn't a huge truck. And we would rely on every place that we played to have a basic sound and lighting system. At On this tour, Bill Graham's production company brought the stage, they brought the sound, PA, and they brought the lighting. So yeah, it, it, was, it was very hard in that way. It was a lot of physical work. And there was a big crew, so myself and Ed Anderson and Lindsey Holland, there was a group of us that just worked for the band, and we were concerned with what happened with them on stage, but Bill Graham's people took care of all the peripheral things. So that was, that was nice. I mean, we had hard work to do, but at least we didn't have to do all the work. Sure, but and, uh, and and yeah, it was. If you remember that time too, it was a funny time in history because there was a trucker's strike at that point, and it was actually dangerous. And trucks in the in the motorcade were actually shot at a couple times. So it was not a lot of fun with that kind of uh, environment out there in the United States. It was a little hostile. More fun. So let's see what else here. Yeah. Has Dylan management or anything like reacted to your exhibition or has there been any contact between you and, and them at all? No, it's, it's a hard thing. If, if you remember, this happened 35 years ago right. and way too many decades have passed and new people have come in to work for, for Bob. Right. The band, of course, does not exist anymore. Um, but I, I did try to, I contacted Dylan's management, OK Management in LA, just to remind them that the exhibition was here. They are playing Cleveland on July 11th, and you know, one hope was that if he's got time, if he could stop by, it would be nice to show him the, the show. I'd also like to show him the other artwork that I deal with in the gallery, because he is a bit of a, a visual artist himself, and he appreciates uh, the visual arts, so it would be a nice opportunity, but the way things go these days with touring, it seems to be off the stage and onto the bus, so there's a slim chance, but maybe someday we'll, we'll be able to get together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the, the guy, John, John Taplin, mm -hmm. was it? Uh, I read that where, where he hooked up with Grossman was working at New, Newport Folk Festival. Right. Um, and, and I mean, there's the stories of the Newport, like when Dylan went electric, you know, Pete yeah. Seeger and the the, pe the trustees of the folk festival, which I don't think Grossman was one of, was he? Or no, no, yeah, no. I mean, physically fighting and and, sure. and all that. And uh, um, and it's a strange thing because I mean, you had people like the Butterfield Blues Band and some of the other blues people too were playing electric instruments. So what was all the furor about? And again, I think it's just people got used to Bob being their hero folk singer, and all of a sudden he was shifting from that and doing something a little different, and they just didn't care for it. But like I said, it was like with this tour in 74, I'm sure that there were some of those people here, and nobody was booing that I can remember. What did, what's Mr. Kaplan do now, or what did he move on to when this was over? John, John left and he went to work as a, a movie production person. He actually worked with Martin Scorsese. He, he helped produce the Mean Streets film of Martin's. And he went on to continue to do that. He founded Lionsgate Studios wow. out in L.A. Wow. Uh, and, and he bounced around a little bit too, uh, somewhat like I did when I left the band. When I left the band, I came back to Cleveland, which was my hometown, and began working more in graphic arts and visual arts and eventually getting into the gallery business. 
John currently works as an adjunct professor at USC talking about modern culture and communications and a lot of other things. And then Robbie, of course, was the other one who decided he didn't want to just do the band thing anymore and uh, stayed in L.A. to do a lot of, again, work with, with Martin Scorsese. Uh, he did a lot of soundtrack work for some of his films. Uh, he works with other people. He did the Native American uh, CDs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so he's got his fingers in a number of different projects, too. Did you uh, happen to attend that last Richard Manuel Cleveland show in 86 at the front row? Yes, I did. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I spent well. a lot of time with Richard that night, long into the morning, mm -hmm. uh, and talked about maybe even getting back together with them. He was not happy about the fact that really the band was just rehashing old things all the time, and he missed the spark of doing something new, and uh, it just wasn't his cup of tea. So It was an oldie show at that point. You yeah. know? I mean, they, they put out some really nice... like albums after that sure and I, I enjoy those and even yeah. that lost tombstone album i don't know if you've heard that mm -hmm. um that just floated around on on a bunch of internet sites the last year mm -hmm. but uh you know it's awfully sad to, to you know go see someone in the two days later and yeah it must have been devastating for you yeah it was very sad and, and like i say i was even contemplating going back with them to do something and try to keep spirits up in general and, and keep things moving along uh, but I also had another life at that point and uh, it wasn't that easy so but yeah when you hear on the news that uh, somebody like that has died and actually even taking his own life was was very poignant and sad Richard was a wonderful person he had a great voice he was a great piano player I was really happy to hear for instance on the remix of the Rock of Ages album that the, his piano was finally brought up to a level where you could hear it better. You know, some things, as careful as some engineers seem to be, there was a lot going on with the band's music, and they could use, lose a lot of subtleties, especially with either Richard's piano playing or sometimes Garth's multi-instrumental work that he was doing. Some things always bound to get buried, and, and part of that may be through that bottom-up uh, approach too. I mean, the bass and the and the drums can can be a, a big little yeah. muddy pond to try to rise up out of. But but it's they were all such great musicians, and it was really a wonderful thing to have been with them. I, I adore them all, and they were just great people. And and they also were the type of musicians who were honestly just total musicians, immersed in what they were doing. They weren't really into this whole rock star thing that has e evolved over the last few decades. It wasn't anything like that. It was about creating great music and, and seeing what they could explore with their musicianship. And uh, the combination, of course, with Dylan and them was just an incredible thing, too, that may be just one of those things that was the right time and the right point in history, and that'll never be replicated ever again. It's gorgeous stuff, and it's it's a wonderful thing to have at least recordings existing that can uh, keep that spirit alive. Whole, whole generations of people. Like, I didn't get to see Dylan for, for he didn't tour till like '86, so I didn't have a chance from you know the '76 tour to '80 or well, '78 tour, I guess, and '79. Yeah. But I, I just didn't have a chance to see him for many years. And, yeah. uh, and there were some funny periods in there too where you know maybe there was some music being experimented with that didn't come off as well I think the last several albums that Bob has done have just been spectacular and he's had very good bands with him uh, the one just prior to this of course included Larry Campbell who was a fine multi-instrumentalist and now Larry's playing with Levon's band and he adds a whole other dimension to that so the experimentation continues. I think Levon just came out with a new album called Electric Dirt. Yeah. And it's another one of these great things that is exploring old music but in new ways. And it's just wonderful stuff. And, and 
then his daughter Amy Helm is also with a group called Olabel, but she's very much alive on this album. And it appears that a lot of the Olabel band is also touring as a part of Levon's band. And so there's great music being played out there, and uh, it's a great thing. All right, we'll conclude with uh, Woodstock's 40th is, is right around the corner. What yeah. is, what's your perspective and best Woodstock memory? And Well, I don't know. That was, that was a funny thing because Albert and the band had committed to do Woodstock without really knowing what it was going to be. Now, this was, again, the first huge outdoor concert that brought a lot of different people together. So there was... I believe a, an interesting element of faith there that it was probably a good thing to do. Bob decided not to do it, so he, he wasn't even going to attempt to do that. But I remember sitting up in Albert's place in Woodstock and we were actually listening to the radio reports of the evolution of what was happening. The fact that the New York Thruway was getting all jammed up, that there were scads of people out there, that the weather was going back and forth from good to bad, there were sloppy conditions, it was in a hilly area. Uh, I believe maybe somebody had died and been born already, which was a strange thing to hear. But the decision was made, yes, let's go do this. So I actually took the truck and I went down first and drove through the back roads and actually had no problem at all getting into the area. Um, but there you've got this giant stage set up and all these people milling around in this amphitheater area in front of the stage and then again it was hilly and there was the pond where people were swimming naked and having a, a lot of fun and just an interesting agglomeration of all types of people. And uh, so then most of the musical acts were helicoptered in there was an area behind the stage that was generally cordoned off where most people couldn't go. And everybody was just kind of hanging out. And there had been originally a schedule of who was going to appear when, but that was trashed pretty early on uh, when certain people either were there or weren't there yet. And so it just became a, a loosely configured approach to the concert. and. Everybody was asked to play whenever they could, essentially. We finally went up on stage in the evening on Saturday. It was dark. And 10 years after, it was playing just before us. Now, that was a little strange. I remember standing there watching them, and Albert Lee and all of his frenetic energy in this loud, bombastic English blues band just cranking it out. And, and I thought, whoa, this is going to be interesting. Because there, you know, this wasn't a, a set up place, so you couldn't really always see a lot out into the crowd. You knew there were these thousands of people out there, but it wasn't actually really obvious. And so every now and then you'd have crowd reaction and all. But on stage it was a different thing. It was almost as if you were just isolated in the nighttime and you were out there almost floating. And so we, we set up and, and the band started playing and one of the, the things that I remember, especially with R Richard singing I Shall Be Released, is that they sounded so angelic in this outdoors evening setting. And it was just chilling. It was just an extraordinary experience. And even though a lot of the fine tuning of the whole thing wasn't to everybody's satisfaction, I think the fact that it came off there was no violence. I think most people had a pretty good and interesting time. And it was a, another one of those watershed moments in, in America's cultural history. So it was, it was really pretty spectacular. And, and I also remember one of the things that we used to take a lot of pride in is that what we did, we did well. And even just driving out of that area when I did, I remember seeing the truck in front of me just slowly kind of drift off and fall into a ditch. And uh, I tried not to do that. Uh, we just kept it on the road and, and kept moving. And, but the, the whole Woodstock thing, Joanna Connors was talking about this relative to an article she's writing for the PD. And living up in Woodstock, 
in knowing what was going on there, there is a spirit of Woodstock, and, and part of that is that you, the people were really beginning to think for themselves and to figure out how they wanted to live. Uh, off the grid was something that was being talked about then, long before it's been talked about now in this sort of green revolution that they think they're going through. Well, one of the other fascinating things about the Woodstock area is you're up in the Catskills. There's a lot of these wonderful old mountains with all these mythologies floating around. And there were people, there's actually been books published called Woodstock Handmade Houses. There are innumerable, wonderful, experimental, innovative dwellings that were created over time by very interesting people. And that's part of what to me was the whole Woodstock experience, is people trying to live off the land to some extent, certainly living outside of the big cities, and being creative about it on any level that they could. So I, I think that that general Woodstock spirit still lives in a lot of people. So I would think it still lives in William Sheely. It does. Uh, I've, I've, I've run my life in a much different way than I'm sure most people do. I stopped working for other people in real jobs, so to speak, 26 years ago. So I've pretty much invented my life. In 1984, I started the Cleveland Artists Foundation as a nonprofit to honor local artists who have evolved in this region. First, it was pretty much a, a historic artist focus. Now it includes contemporary people as well. I've had a number of different art galleries. Uh, I started a little nonprofit organization uh, and back in 2002 called New Cat, which focused more on electronic arts, and we did that in different ways for several years. But this iteration now with Cocoon Arts Club, kind of, it's based on the old Cocoon Arts Club idea that was born in 1911, of again, keeping that artistic creative spirit always moving forward in some way, not getting stuck in just traditional types of ways of creating art, but always looking at new things. Uh, the computer graphics world and electronic arts get the same type of knock in a way that photography did when it first attempted to be recognized as a fine art. There, there was always this unfortunate reaction that, oh, well, this is made with a machine, it's not really art. Well, the machines are just tools. Brushes and, and other things are tools, too. And, you actually really do have to have an interest in learning what a machine can do and how you can manipulate it to become a more creative instrument. And that's the creative element. Uh, machines don't create their own art. It takes human interaction. So I, I just think that human creativity in the arts are, are one of the best things that humans have to offer. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing to be involved with and I intend to do it until I drop. Very good. Well, thank you very much for your time and thank your you. efforts and your career. You're I'm right. envious. Thanks. <laughs>